welcome to you. Um, my name is Nicole Mitchell. And the next thing we have for our agenda right now is a panel discussion on collaboration and community. So the first person I'm going to introduce is Jason Robinson. He's an assistant professor of music at Amherst College, holding a PhD in music from University of California, San Diego. And as a saxophonist and composer, Robinson is a critically acclaimed distinct voice in the new generation of creative musicians in equal dialogue with jazz, popular music, experimental music, and electronic music. He performs regularly as a soloist, acoustically, and with electronics, and with his group, the Janus Ensemble, in a variety of other collaborative contexts. Um, Robinson states that the success of new inter- and multidisciplinary graduate music programs will require broader attention in ways that music is taught at the undergraduate level and how music is understood, <coughs> compartmentalized, and vocationalized beyond the academy. So with no further ado, let's welcome Jason Robinson and his group. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so nice to come back to UCSD. Oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> and see so many UCSD friends here. Uh, excuse me. I should ask you to raise your hands if you don't have a UCSD connection. There might be four hands. Oh, more than more than okay, more than. I'm sorry, bad joke. <laughs> so, um. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today, I, I don't really have a formal paper to read. Instead, I wanted to talk a bit about some ideas that I've been um, trying to think through uh, recently, um, probably because of my, you know, the sort of stage I'm at in my career. Most of this has to do with institution building and, and department building. I'm an assistant professor at Amherst College um, in my third or fifth year, depending on how you count it. Um, and... Um, uh, what I'm going to try to do here is sort of both widen the lens a bit about how we think about um, disciplinarity in the academy and also how we sort of think uh, about, about um, pragmatic sort of job career path um, issues um, as educators and how we, how we communicate with our students. So much of what I'm going to be talking about today is in dialogue with a book by Louis Menand, um, he's a professor of English from Harvard University. Prior to joining um, the faculty at Harvard, he was at Columbia. And his book is called The Marketplace of Ideas, Reform and Resistance in the American University. And it's a, um, it's a sort of collection of essays originally given as, as talks at Harvard um, in a book series called Ideas of Our Time, edited by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Um, in the book... He says this, interdisciplinarity is an administrative name for an anxiety and a hope that are personal. Throughout, his, uh, throughout, throughout the book, he sort of hedges on both the side of optimism and the side of pessimism in terms of institutional interdisciplinarity. So I'll be kind of um, uh, relating to both of those positions throughout this. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, I, I sort of, something that's, 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 um, you know, kind of a backdrop um, for my presentation are these few ideas. The success of new inter- and multidisciplinary graduate music programs will require broader attention to both of these. One, the ways in which music is taught at the undergraduate level, and two, how music is understood, compartmentalized, and vocationalized in and beyond the academy. And uh, I think what I'm trying to argue here is that interdisciplinarity in graduate music programs rests within much larger debates about the nature and purpose of higher education at all levels and how music is understood within American society. Um, this term, interdisciplinarity, that I've used uh, in my talk's title, it is certainly a kind of um, a sort of um, key term today in, in the academy. Um, if you take more of a kind of pessimistic view, it's, it's an idea that may be sort of imposed from above, uh, administrators and administrative structures encouraging those of us in the so-called trenches, the, the teaching and research faculty at institutions, um, uh, to, to implement a kind of new way of doing business, a way of sort of 
not changing the, the sort of structures of our departments, but also changing the kind of nature of the work that we do. Um, one of the things that Manan points out is that there, there may be these other sort of ways of thinking about what interdisciplinarity is. We tend to think of it as something that's about kind of crossing boundaries. Some of us prefer interdisciplinarity as a sort of framework or multidisciplinarity. Um, there is a sort of uh, a boundary between one discourse and another discourse. And what interdisciplinarity does is it encourages us to move across those boundaries or to draw across those boundaries. But one thing we may find out if we look closely at this idea, it may actually um, uh, be sort of um, affirming that which we're trying to deconstruct. In other words, interdisciplinarity relies on disciplinarity and relies on a certain um, way of being able to identify that which is the canon within any particular <coughs> discipline. Um, and how can there be interdisciplinarity without a discipline itself? How are those disciplines then constructed over time, uh, at critical moments in the evolution of institutions? And I would also ask that how might these questions be related uh, to the ways in which fields and expertises are defined and debated? And I don't mean just in the academy. I also, I also mean sort of out in the, um, I'm going to use this term a few times, the so-called real world of music making. Out in the real world of music making as composers, as performers, as technologists or whatever else we may be doing. These kinds of debates take place in these other contexts as well. Just one example is the, the, the recent um, sort of discourse around Alex Hoffman um, critiquing Wayne Shorter. I guess that's kind of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> you guys know what you know about this, right? It's, it's sort of nasty. Maybe it'll go away sooner rather than later. But Alex Hoffman, after Wayne Shorter's recent um, album was either released or the PR campaign was really starting to be mobilized, a uh, uh, young New York-based tenor saxophonist, Alex Hoffman, um, what did he say, like, on Facebook? You know what he said? Go for it, Alex. <laughs> he said, fuck Wayne Shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Which then led to, um, I mean, that was sort of obviously kind of vitriolic, but it led to this really interesting ongoing debate about canonization and skill acquisition in jazz and jazz studies, both in and out of the academy. That's my more sort of neutral uh, professor way of saying it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take a few different um, paths in, 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 in the rest of what I'm saying here. Um, first is, I think we both, we, we, we operate with kind of two understandings of what higher education is. And these understandings have um, deep historical roots. One understanding is um, knowledge for knowledge, knowledge is sick. So the academy functions as a site of knowledge production in which um, the pragmatic or sort of real world apl applicability of the kinds of conversations we have are less important to us. Um, at an institution that I uh, at, that I teach at, at Amherst College, this is um, it's sort of highly um, it's actually very challenging to start to talk about the vocational or to have vocational training. Much of what we do in small liberal arts colleges is sort of resist letting the the, the, the dialogue move in that direction. There's a, a, a very different understanding of what the what higher education is um, that's happening um, as well. And that is, um, no pun intended, the instrumentalist view of, of education. And the instrumentalist view is exactly the opposite of knowledge for knowledge sakes. Um, what we do when we, when we are trained um, is uh, um, we develop applicable real-world job skills that we then apply in a, um, in a vocation and a career that we, we start developing once we graduate. So these two things are coexisting. First, I'll talk a little bit about the Academy as knowledge production. This is deeply connected to the history of the American um, college and university, deeply connected to the idea of the liberal arts. And by the history, I'm talking about the, you know, 
200-year history of higher education in the United States. Um, uh, and when, when you look at that kind of the sort of long view of the history of higher education, we can identify certain institutions as um, the sort of proving grounds of new ideas about how to structure higher education. So much of Manan's book is actually about you know, the, the history of Harvard and of, of Columbia as sort of precedent setters for how liberal arts education is implemented across the country, how things like general education or core breadth requirements are implemented. And much of these, I mean, th this long view, we might go back to something like the 1860s or the 1870s after, after um, uh, the Civil War and see how the modern American universities started to, uh, to, started to develop. And in this long view, we see things like general education being established, we see this sort of idea that there are certain um, there are certain conversations or discourses that we should all share a part in, and it provides a certain service to our society to have people sharing a certain common conversation. Um, and this has been implemented in a variety of ways. The core requirement. Um, so at Harvard and at Columbia, this led to the kind of great books model of general education, where it might just be one or two classes during their entire undergraduate education, but the idea is that you've studied the same few books, and then we can have a kind of com conversation that, uh, that, that then is based on that mutual experience, just like we can talk about Beethoven or Brahms or something like this. Um, Part of what I'm trying to say here is that we might think about this history as very intimately connected to the ways in which we've designed um, our departments. There was a very a, another a kind of contrasting idea was general education as breadth. So the kinds of um, institutions I went to as an undergraduate or graduate student, they were more along these lines, uh, sort of set of GE classes that you take. You choose a couple from this category, a couple from this category, and a couple from this category. And in doing so, we develop a kind of well-rounded experience that prepares us for something later. Um, uh, and I'm not sure what that something is. Um, I'll just say this. At the research university, um, and the kind of, well, the research university is in a kind of dialectical relationship with these new ideas, well, with these emerging ideas about what the liberal arts curriculum is for undergraduates. Um, professional schools, uh, like medicine, uh, medical schools, law schools, they sort of sit a little bit um, to, the, to the side. Um, so here are a couple of ideas about what the liberal arts might do, um, might um, uh, serve for us. Colin Diver, the president emeritus of, of Reed College, says that education is a process of self-fulfillment, self-realization, through, uh, through the cultivation, cherishing, and love of knowledge. Kevin Galbanco says that, quote, the fruits of a true liberal education, creativity, wisdom, humility, and insight into ethical, uh, is, excuse me, insight into ethical as well as empir empirical questions. So this is part of the kind of, you know, the academy as knowledge production this sort of perspective. But I would argue that our current sort of modern current perspective, uh, oh, five minutes, okay, is that the, of, is, is sort of dominated by the instrumentalist view. So here, uh, here is Colin Diver um, summarizing this. Why get an education? Most people answer this, that question instrumentally. They view education as a means to an end. The end might be to enter a particular profession, to earn a handsome salary, to create power or influence, or to create things, including ideas of utility or beauty. According to this instrumental view, education is a process of acquiring the knowledge, skills, credentials, or pedigree deemed as prerequisite for attaining a particular status. I would say that today our dialogue is, is marked by this notion of marketable skills. And I would say that this has evolved into a more radical position. The fundamental purpose of a college degree of any type is to provide not only the requisite skills for a particular job, but it must also provide a clear pathway to that job in the form of job placement or corporate partnerships. And I connect this up to uh, the sort of neoliberalist um, economic viewpoint that's, that's um, dominated American politics maybe since Reagan or maybe even before then. 
and regardless of Republican or or uh, or Democrat uh, in the White House. And here are uh, two quotes uh, from first from George Bush: "Education is how to make sure we've got a workforce that's productive and competitive." And then Barack Obama: "Countries that outteach us today will outcompete us tomorrow." So by neoliberalism, I, I mean a kind of full-fledged, absolutely invested uh, state in a, a particular type of free, open, free market capitalism. So our educational system now, as an instrument, is should be designed from this viewpoint, should be designed to accomplish these means. And for-profit colleges fit um, this model precisely. So the former director of the University of Phoenix says, I'm happy that there are places in the world where people sit down and think. We need that, but that's very expensive, and not everybody can do that. Um, and as a somewhat recent, <laughs> as a, in a recent um, article in the New York Times, it turns out that um, that for-profit colleges are not only not placing students uh, in jobs at the rate at which they said they they were, they're also not providing a cheaper education than most public universities and colleges across the country. Um, I'll leave out the thing about medical and law school. But did, did, did you realize that in the, in the, as we sort of went into the 1900s, you could get a, a, a law degree or a medical degree from uh, Columbia or Harvard without an undergraduate degree? Really interesting. That, that shift changed the idea about the liberal arts um, education when um, a four-year degree was required to enter these professional schools. I would also argue that, in addition to this kind of neoliberalist idea that's prevailing, there's also this sort of notion of assessment that's become very um, powerful in public discourses around education. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Ken Bernstein's uh, article that was published in Academe, the AAUP's online newsletter. Uh, he, he published an article called Warning from the Trenches, a high school teacher tells college ed educators what they can expect in the wake of No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. He was a retiring government um, uh, uh, teacher, high school teacher, that was sort of giving a, a warning to college professors about the impact of teaching to the test since No Child Left Behind was implemented in like 2003 or 2004. And you know, from this view is this kind of, I would argue, we have a kind of corporatizing or corporate influence within public education. It's having profound, a profound impact on the way we understand what higher education is. So there's been a, a, a full-scale invasion of public education by a kind of corporate language, the language of student, lear student learning outcomes or student learning outcome assessments. And um, uh, what Frank Frutti says is that, quote, the very purpose of this organizational instrument is to accomplish a shift in emphasis from learning to outcomes. Um, and this comes out in a number of ways, um, you know, in the sort of, thank you, in the public sector, uh, you know, for high school and middle school teachers, elementary school teachers in, in California, uh, connecting, um, you know, uh, teacher tenure and pay to student achievement on standardized tests. Um, it also impacts the accreditation process of um, both schools of music and higher education institutions. Um, here's Bernstein giving us a warning. If you teach either in a medical school or in programs that offer courses required as part of the pre-med curriculum, and I would extend this to sort of any subject in higher education. Do you want the fatality rates of patients treated by the doctors whom you have taught to be used to judge your performance? This may be, I mean, if we were really going to sort of get doomsday-ish, we, we, we might imagine a future in which, especially if we're in public higher education, in which new kinds of assessments are in place that, that track the way our graduates achieve in their fields and then is reflected back on us. So how does this instrumentalism function within music higher education? Well, on the one hand, um, a college degree from this perspective is designed to prepare you to enter the workforce. 
And um, I feel like I spend the majority of my advising and mentoring time uh, at Amherst College talking to students or sort of readjusting their expectations about how you get ready to hit it big in the music industry. Um, or their notion of what, of what a kind of job path is. In the context of jazz, this often means having a very kind of frank discussion about the jazz education industry, about what it means to be a jazz composer or a jazz performer, and the ways in which our jazz studies programs may or may not be preparing students for what actually exists in the quote-unquote real world of jazz performance, something like that. Um, and the, this, uh, this plays out in a number of ways, including the accreditation process. So here is from the, um, let's see here, National Association of Schools of Music, NASM, their uh, competency summary for Bachelor of Music program in Jazz Studies. Now, it seems a little innocuous here, but if you put this together with the ways in which um, colleges and universities are accredited across the country, we realize that these kinds of goals that are set in place, and then if we as educators implement those in the accreditation process, um, there's a pretty profound long-term impact on how these kinds of goals play out within the assessment process. So for instance, if we made uh, a list of goals like this, that our students were to be able to do this, be able to do this, be able to do this, even in, in the case at Amherst College, for instance, in 2008, when we were going through our accreditation process, we're told by the accreditors that, well, we just need you to, to make this checklist, this list of goals it won't really impact anything later. Let's just do this and then we'll all be copacetic. Because we as a faculty could have said, you know, we don't need to be accredited. Not like law. We've all sort of drank the Kool-Aid. So we will now be accredited. So what happened was, um, a few years later, the accreditation agency came back and said, okay, now we need to see the deliverables. We need to see the what we need to implement an assessment process to see if you've been able to track the way that students lead. Here's one of the um, things on our checklist. Lives of consequence. <laughs> you can imagine 150 uh, faculty members sitting down together saying, okay, what are we going to put on this checklist? We want our students to lead lives of consequence, which very kind of, in terms of liberal arts education, that's pretty key to what we believe, right? But in this new kind of corporatization of the assessment process, it's difficult to assess that. And we have now been held to the fire to assess that. Um, so why am I saying all of this in the context, and now I'm going to conclude, sorry. Um, why am I saying this in the context of interdisciplinarity? Well, if, we, if we're thinking about developing new ways, which I, I'm an ardent believer in interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinary. If we are going to think about new ways of constructing or revising, as Vijay was pointing out, our sort of curriculums that maybe haven't changed for a long time, um, I, I think we need to um, see the, the larger context in which our debates will take place within. And that is within the, the idea of what the academy is as a site of knowledge production, the idea of, the, of higher education as an instrument, and the ways in which we live within these kind of larger ecosystems of instrumentality, why a student would, um, would achieve an undergraduate degree, why a student would then go on to graduate school, why a student might make the next step, um, uh, and then you know, in, enter the professional world or enter uh, the professoriate. So out of time, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Our next featured guest is Dr. Glenn Whitehead. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts and Director of the Music Program at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. In 2006, he founded the Interdisciplinary BA at UCCS. And he's currently also principal trumpet at Colorado Springs Chamber Orchestra. And as an educator, he founded the Electroacoustic Improvisation 
Ensemble at CU Denver. Um, he's going to speak with us about sound design in theater and performance productions being a key vehicle for new innovation. So please welcome Glenn Whitehead. A second to set this up. I'm sure this works. Hopefully it works. excited to be here and uh, with you today. I, my, my talk is slightly transformed. Um, when I started thinking about the, the theme of, of the symposium and collaboration community, I started thinking about our overall program. And it might be better suited to explain to you the broader view of how, uh, the, the how and, and why um, we created uh, this particular bachelor's degree at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs and the circumstances surrounding it, because I think it would be useful. I don't know if we, I have any groundbreaking ideas to add except the context of my experience uh, and, and um, being sort of involved in, in creating sort of on the, on, the, uh, the, on the ground level, from the ground level up. Um, because it's kind of an interesting, and it really overlaps, I can see the design and the uh, um, and uh, picking who goes uh, and grouping people together here because a lot of it resonates with, with uh, Professor Robinson's talk in some regards too, um, some very directly. But collaboration and community, and I, I realized that um, that uh, I, I hadn't thought about it in, in this broader context, but we had been building this program in, in a large part um, in a collaborative and a community process, and we were building collaborative um, means and building communities. We never articulated that specifically. And I think we're going to start doing that in some regards. But um, but the other broader context here that that um, that um, is uh, in relation to the symposium here is we're really trying to lay the groundwork for a graduate degree, and that's sort of our next big goal. I think it's starting to be fleshed out in that way, um, and and I'd like to maybe get some ideas from from people here in that regard. You know, uh, after the fact here. But um, so <clears throat> when uh, our freshmen arrive, um, we're, we're trying to start from, from the very beginning to kind of reframe um, their vocabulary and, and give them a sense of musicians in the broader context uh, and shake loose the broader definitions of the music field. And music is an art form of sound. Um, this is trying to be interdisciplinary and we're trying to get them to to recontextualize their ideas as to play an instrument, that the instrument is, 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 has a long history as a, a piece of sound sculpture, for instance. Um, we're trying to get them to realize that now you're, you have a task here if you're going to be a musician, you're an artist, and you have a role in society. That's very important. And if you accept that role, you're going to have to take the responsibility to try to find your place in that, in the society, and in our culture, in a, in a productive way. And you create your community. You build an audience, you find your colleagues by binding people through a shared sonic plasma of, of sonic experience, basically. And that, trying to instill the idea, however, however um, unreal it might be, that sound and music is a very, very powerful entity and a powerful medium that a lot of times gets labeled, gets a lot of labels, gets a lot of talk, it's a huge music industry. but. Unlike any other discipline, particularly, you know, never mind the arts, but other, but other disciplines, that if you can impart your craft with other people in an interdisciplinary way, chances are you have something very, really, to, not only to add, but you will come up with brand new ideas with other people, and you will enable other people from other disciplines to come up with new ideas, particularly those colleagues that are very interested in what you do. Um, music is an active and not a reactive field, just like in the arts. Uh, it's, you know, unlike visual arts, I think we, 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 we're working right alongside visual arts, of course. And visual arts, you know, you make things. 
you just you make things. You make things with your hands. You make things out of ideas. And we're just trying to sort of put that right on their on their table at the same time. Musicians teaching musicians to explore, build confidence, to find new colleagues, and pursue ideas with other arts and especially non-music fields. Uh, so our laboratory here is uh, UCCS, which is a small, innovative, interconnected campus uh, in the heart of Colorado Springs. It's sort of at ground zero in some political and socioeconomic situations. It's a uh, very big military presence. And this campus is, is, is lean, mean, really, really underfunded. Um, but it has some really good people there and colleagues talk back and forth. And it's still small enough that, you know, we do have some communication and a lot of interchanging ideas. Um, for instance, we just went through a big campus-wide general education reform, and all of those things are coming right back at me, you know, and I'm sort of shaking in my boots. I was on the committee, and one of the coolest things that happened was um, we wanted to do something really different at some at the beginning level and maybe like at the mid-level. So what we actually ended up doing, and it passed the whole campus, 85% of faculty voted for it, um, included is this very aggressive um, requirement called the Advanced Core, which is at the junior level. So all junior level, juniors have to take it, including transfer students, and that was the big one. And this is an interdisciplinary class with a sort of rubric knowledge in action. And it was based on um, uh, models of the interdisciplinary arts classes that we make. So when we got this conversation going, and when, when we finally just people that were at the table um, were explaining, you know, our sort of visual performing arts interdisciplinary classes, it got there was almost no resistance among 25, um, you know, faculty members from across the colleges. We got College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, which is the largest college that we're in, uh, College of Engineering, College of Business, College of Education, and, and College of Nursing. Um, so this Bachelor's of Visual and Performing Arts Music Concentration, it's, it's at once a really interesting program. I think the, the, the thing that's been really interesting about it is that we were giving a charge from the upper administration to be innovative and interdisciplinary. And that was the key. This, this, it did come from above, and it ended up being a very important thing. Um, because we had to, we had to actually um, be accountable in some regard for doing it. Uh, so when we came up with ideas that were completely out of the blue and unimplementable, and seemingly like the kind of course that'd be like, you can't teach something like that. That's ridiculous. It takes too many resources. Uh, it doesn't really need to. We said, well, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we're doing. It would help things pass in the curriculum, you know. So right now, we actually just split, we're growing, and we just split from sort of this overall music major into two different tracks. We're trying to be a little bit more um, <clears throat> biting, you know, and have some more, some, some more teeth with, our, with our, our music sort of major situation. So we have composition, sound design, and orchestration, and creative music practice and technology. And that's sort of our interdisciplinary version of composition and performance. And interdisciplinarity here is an interesting uh, term because we realized after some years of having to just wrestle with this term, you got to kind of get past the term uh, in some ways that we're dealing with, in some ways, you know, very malleable situation, but two basic frameworks of interdisciplinarity. That which is expanding the music discipline, just expanding with ideas, letting the sort of doors open, and, and uh, getting rid of the walls in which we found ourselves, you know, as undergraduates in some regards with sort of the, with the sort of, you know, boxed in music discipline of performance um, and, and just new ideas. Students love this stuff. They really become empowered as instrumentalists. A pianist is still a pianist. And they don't really have to change what they do. They find that they're actually uh, very powerful artists being a really good pianist. And it actually reinforced the idea of performance, the skill, the high, high skill level, high musicality, get as good as you can, learn as much as you can, reinforce and help build interdisciplinary ideas. And that was an affirming, that was a really affirming idea. It was kind of a revelation to me because for the first few years I thought this is going to sort of gloss over musicianship. This is going to lead us into some opaque 
um, non-disciplinary kind of thing, which I, I didn't want to do at all. I'm a trumpet player. My life is about playing the trumpet in many regards, you know. And that didn't happen at all. In fact, it's, it, that's been a really good, pleasant surprise. Um, and <clears throat> again, a lot of my experiences are about surprises, about going somewhere, not knowing exactly what you're doing, and you find out the result when you get there. Um, but this degree is, is tough because it's hard to market to high school music students. Um, and uh, at the same time, when you say things like, you know, improvisation, music creation is, a, is a, an essential element throughout the curriculum. Um, you know, even music educators, you go to the, the music education sort of state conference, they don't really understand what you're talking about. And there's a real gulf in the music field and, and music education systems, um, particularly with, with, um, with um, you know, uh, music education degrees in this regard. We're finding that trying to put an improvisation and composition creation in every aspect, we're not there yet by any means, but even like music theory all the way through, music history, doing different ways of teaching, we were fulfilling inadvertently uh, a goal of the campus of new ways of teaching, new ways of learning. Don't just sit there and talk to your, talk to your students in a lecture format, have them doing and creating in new ways, and it helped us just sort of carry through that goal. Um, in the creation of this degree, uh, it was one of these hotbeds of, of political territory across the arts. One of the best things about it was all the arts were put into the same department, and this was made out of what was a visual arts department. Um, there was no music program, there was no theater program, but there was a theater professional theater company on campus, but no theater program. And we just hired our first tenure line theater person three years ago. That was how hard sort of worn the uh, politics were. So if anyone in, uh, in this territory, I would just offer a little, a few pieces of advice. Um, you're going to be dealing with dynamics, politics, and territories of the different arts. And you need to find colleagues that you can talk to and that are interested in your work, interested in music, and, and want to find common ground. As much as people think that there isn't, that's, that's what, you know, the, 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 um, and you need good leadership from above or with a well-defined charge and purpose. Um, so our interdisciplinary courses are as such. Thank you. Um, a quick overview: ethnography, performing, performing arts, art in time and space, arts innovations. Freshmen have to take one of these. Our upper division collaborative courses, sound art, creative sonic worlds, is one of our most interesting courses, and this is where we actually sort of really connected music with sound art, and we we were teaching um, as as flawed as it is. Uh, the connection between performance and installation and multimedia and environment, place, and space. Performance art, which Professor Jane Riegler started down there, uh, is another one. And uh, interarts improvisation, which, which got taught a few times and was the, the hardest course to teach. I tried to, to be, make this big interarts improvisational push, and, and it, it, it sort of hit a brick wall. It was, it was too much. Our ensembles are, um, we've got ensembles like the Electric Acoustic Ensemble, the Vapid Vocal Ensemble, which is a um, contemporary vocal ensemble across platforms. Um, and then we do integrated theater music productions uh, where we get rid of the pit idea. And music students have to create music inside the production. Of course, you can't do this without a colleague in theater who's willing to do it. And that's the key. Without that, you got nothing. Um, we did the Bacchae and Salome. It was really one of the coolest collaborations I've ever done, um, bar none. And we're, we're just going forward now. We've got a film scoring course. We decided to get pragmatic and just like tackle this area. Found a person who's, um, who's a film scorer in Hollywood coming to teach for us. And we're doing all this on like fringe budgets. It's, it's really tough. Um, and it's by the seat of our parents. Um, and then composition and sound design and orchestration is a composition uh, class when we're talking about orchestrating a chamber orchestra or orchestrating a theatrical production in this space and, and combining these sound art and performative and innovative ideas. And here's a little clip of one of, one of the uh, theater production things. Just a... This is a really bad video, but this is sort of... This is an introduction uh, to Salome last year.
And mind you, this is in the professional theater venue called Theater Works, which is a traditional theater company. And I really have to hand it to the directors of this theater company for putting up with this. They, they really were, they got very courageous. I think we kind of challenged them, where if they didn't, you know, we kind of took them to task a little bit, and then they really, they really, um, they really came to our, to our aid. <coughs> so our pursuit of a graduate degree. Um, we're at this stage now suddenly, and it's, we found ourselves here. And we suddenly realized that, ooh, you know what? We can offer, we can turn our 4,000 level classes and cross list as 5,000 level. And I had a colleague just tell me this, I had no idea. And you can be, you can offer grad courses. Really? That's really interesting. We get calls all the time from music educators um, who want graduate level work, you know, and continuing education. So we're going to start next year um, with these three courses at 5,000 level and try to cross list them and see what happens. Composition, sound design, orchestration, 20th, 20th century music and sound and sonic art, which is going to be a hybrid um, online course, and um, 20th century music entrepreneurship. And the sort of music business entrepreneurship aspect here is something that we felt we had to tackle. Um, you know, and, and just try to, as we've had too many students go out and not know what to do and how to do it. We figured, you know, despite the rhetoric of the real world and the, the assessment process and everything, it was simply from our responsibility angle and from wanting to help our students have a better ability to just dive in somehow or know where they're going to go. So something... You know, we're going to tackle that, um, you know, tackle their lives in the future. Um, we're looking to build an MM or an FFMA in the near future, including the possibility of a five-year combined BAMA, which is the big, the big rave on campus right now. And it's a little bit shoddy, I think, because, you know, there's, a, there's four or five classes overlapped with their senior classes. So they take those, you know, 4,000 level classes that then both apply for their under, to their undergraduate and the graduate degree. So what is the BA and what is the MA in that case? But, you know, we'll look at that in, in the regard. So thank you very much. <laughs> but our third guest in, for this panel is Adam Tinkle. <coughs> Adam Tinkle is an artist educator and scholar, active in music sound and interdisciplinary performance in media arts. And after studies in cultural theory, ethnomusicology, and experimental composition at Wesleyan, he is now at UC San Diego where he continues both scholarship and music making. He's the founder and leader of the Universal Language Orchestra, a group of 8 to 12 year olds that are um, based in a community center where he is introducing them to instrument building, electronics, improvisation, and various modes of notation and composition. So please welcome Adam Taylor. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be on this panel. There's a lot of points of connection, as you'll see with the last two people who have spoken. So I'm here to really ask whether the future of music outside the academy has any bearing on these questions of the future of music inside it that we've been talking about and that this conference is going to need to address. At least since Milton Babbitt's uh, notorious essay, which somebody else titled, Who Cares If You Listen, university-based <coughs> music experimentalists, like most of us, have requested autonomy from the valuations of music and society at large. And I've heard many of your music, you know, the people in this room's music, and I can say confidently that that autonomy has been won. <laughs> the ivory tower gives us all a warrant, and should we choose to accept it, to do pure research into the development of musical art without worrying about our CD sales. So the rest of what I'm going to be saying should not be taken as a critique of that. I'm not going to be drawing a dichotomy betwe between aesthetic experimentation on, for its own sake on one hand, and a socially engaged commitment to music for the masses on the other. Um, rather, I'm interested in asking questions about how those of us in the academy who would like to make a community-engaged practice part of our research program and our life's work, going outside of the ivory tower every once in a while, how we can do that in a way that plays to our strengths. Um, this paper argues that the cur current moment, the moment of economic austerity presents an opportunity for people like us to crystallize new ways of teaching music and ultimately to allow academy-oriented experimental art practices to rejoin the conversation on social justice and the transformation of our society. 
don't have time to talk about this in sort of comparative perspective, but I may write my dissertation on this in comparative perspective. So if you have ideas about other places that this is happening other than the one community center where I'm working, I'd love to hear about them at lunch. Get some references. So the Children's Universal Language Orchestra, or ULO, as I'm going to call it throughout this talk, is based at the Spring Valley Community Center, which is in the heart of one of San Diego County's most underserved and diverse zip codes. It's a partnership between the UCSD Music Program and the Community Center. The center recruits the kids, provides the space, advises us on the needs of the local population, which largely were that there was no arts enrichment at all available for kids of that age um, and no performance opportunities in that community. But beyond this, no guidelines were imposed on the UCSD team, which is obviously a super rare, no aesthetic uh, program. So the 8 to 12 year olds with whom I work have little access to instruments. Um, our group has next to no budget, and we have just two hours a week of class time in a multi purpose space, not designed for music, usually. We're starting a collaboration with an art museum this year, so there's some other opportunities. But the constraints of this project basically mirror and amplify austere conditions for arts teachers across the US. The ULO is a kind of a test case for creating a music program with the most limited resources imaginable, basically. So the program we've created and perpetuated embraces musical practices that a lot of people here engage in, and you'd find adults hard at work at in any progressive music department at a university. Like Nicole said, these include building homemade musical instruments, developing extended and unconventional playing techniques, improvisation, composition with graphic scores, field recording, integration of theatrical, choreographic, and textual elements into multimedia performance art. So if you're a practitioner of any of the aforementioned, you might be thinking, wow, I've always wanted to do that, but the upper income parents of the kids who live in the neighborhoods around my university would never tolerate such a bohemian and transgressive cable turning on their piano lesson streams for their kids. An <laughs> 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 auto-ethnographic admission has to be made at the outset. But we were invited into this community to create this program. The absence of the constraints on our activity there is a direct function of the lack of resources and arts enrichment in that community. Um, so, but as will become clear, <laughs> yeah, austerity presents an opening sometimes for experimental arts practices to find new audiences and sources of support. Another topic that I hope to explore in dissertation, and another thing that I'd love to hear from you about if you have good references. Black, you know, black arts movement, you know, great stuff there. Um, so, if you're not already a convert to the experimental practices the ULO deploys, on the other hand, um, you might just be asking why. The very fact that a lot of the aforementioned techniques, for, you know, improvisation, sound art, tactics, graphic notations, are practiced primarily in the orbit of universities and a few other places, points to the possibility that these experimental practices can or should only be explored by advanced musicians, a possibility I'm going to try to quickly acknowledge but ultimately dispel. Those of us who created the ULO, like most university-based uh, experimentalists, have received extremely conventional training in traditional Western music on Western instruments, Yet we'd all move to aesthetic and philosophical positions far distant from the ones that had animated the teachers and settings that initially provided us with our basic musical competency and ability to read Western education. As young students, we had practiced old music. As grad students, we were into new music. <laughs> I'm being a bit flip, but we knew we would be working with children who not only would lack a nuanced map of the musical terrain, but who would likely have no connection at all to Western art music except through its points of connection with mass-mediated popular culture. So shearing away the historicism and referentiality from our musical vocabularies would be essential. We might mention Parch or Cage or Cardew or Braxton in planning sessions, but once in the community center, their theories and legacies would have to be boiled down to ideas graspable by children who might not even know what a pitch or a meter is. So from my experiences with ULO, which I'm going to detail in a moment, I've come to believe that the looser hierarchies and new tools for sound making represented by some of these comp composers and practices um, might actually have an edge over Eurocentric school music for getting kids excited about making music, and then once excited, the idea is hopefully they'll pursue whatever domain of music interests them. But there's even an argument to be made, uh, and I think Glenn is actually sort of starting to make it, <laughs> that the current state of music ed is, is actually pathological when viewed in comparison with the other arts, and that the injection of experimental practices with a looser relation to any extant tradition uh, is actually a form of remediation for music ed, you know, um, pre-college. Envision, if you would, a children's creative writing or an art class that was narrowly focused on reproducing an already existing body of work in that medium. In any art but, but music, kids are asked first and foremost to render their own visions of the world and exercise their imagination. And development of canonical modes of expression and technical skills are not ignored. For example, life drawing and poetic meters are introduced at some point to help kids structure their creativity and establish forms. But a major goal 
is surely to get kids to externalize, take pride in, critique, ultimately hone self-expressions coming from their own subjectivity. So we know that the focus of Western art music instruction is on the reproduction of music initially articulated in a place and time other than the one in which it's then sounded. Conservatories, orchestras, not just school music. But I, and I'm no way impugning the acquisition of the literacy that this type of education provides. I'm very glad that I possess it, as I'm sure most people here are. Um, but I'd like to argue that our self-satisfaction at being notationally literate falls really short of mattering in a wider sense and to a you know, longer view. With music programs getting slashed nationwide, we need to recognize that the music literate public sphere, small as it is now, is about to just completely implode. State actors having deemed music literacy, along with plenty of other perfectly important things like social studies and phys ed, just not important enough to spend limited resources on. So with the broad-based support it once received largely rescinded, except in Venezuela, uh, except for the, you know, <laughs> like, the, except for the, well, especially for the working and underclasses in this country, we continue to make Western music literacy the essential first stop. We're doing nothing but closing off uh, this whole range of instrument-based musical practices to a huge segment of the populace. Obviously, people are getting more able to access things like GarageBand, but that's slightly different. If acoustic and instrumental music are to remain vital into the future, we need to elaborate and promulgate ways for people to create in that vein that are neither bound by ethnic or cult cultural particularism, nor overdetermined by technologized and mediated mass culture. Of course, as Patricia Sheehan Campbell's pioneering ethnographic work shows, children, with or without access to instruments, spontaneously permutate the music of their environment to create original music in the course of daily life. And, uh, it's, the book's called Music in Their Heads um, by Campbell. But most musical discourse on school, uh, sorry, in school, on TV, and maybe very slightly less on YouTube is predicated on a bright line differentiating uh, this informal and constant musical play that all children do from authorized and valorized music instantiated in scores and mediated recordings. From this, children can't help but conclude that the music they make is somehow less real and certainly less valuable than music is taught and music is heard in professionalized contexts. And it's exactly that conclusion that we hope to overturn by focusing the ULO on offering children an immediate sense of ownership, authorship, and creative agency over the music they create. In effect, we want to get them to sketch into being their own ideas and sound. So they sail right over the normal stumbling blocks of music education, like embarrassment, shyness, favoring consumption and conventionality over production and originality. With the aim that they ultimately developed over a longer time scale, a greater attunement and facility with the world of sound making in general. In Yolo, we build our own musical instruments from cheap and readily available materials, constructing them in the most transparent ways and where possible, we ask kids to take part in their creation. If you want to see some of the instruments or performances on them, our website is universallanguageorchestra.blogspot.com. It's easy to remember. Uh, or you can access it through my website, adamtinkle.com. Through this practice, we aim to introduce them to music and sound in an open field and with no established performance practice. The kids of the orchestra are the ones who decide how their instruments are to be sounded. Thus, we borrow from the field of extended instrumental technique the research interest in what sounds are possible, but we're not framing sounds and noises from Europe's harmonic rules and regulations. In the sense, we align our operational definition of music with that of American experimentals in Lucid's cage, or <coughs> sound. As it happens, though, I'm not sure a kid has ever questioned aloud whether any of the sound-making activities we engage in are music, although I don't doubt that their parents have on many occasions. <laughs> Since our goal is to short-circuit the long road to authorship in most music traditions through this quick sketch methodology that I've been talking about, we ask kids to freely improvise at every stage of the creative process. Many of our activities explicitly guide even the youngest children in improvisation, um, and as I, including you know, on their instruments, and then I, as I'll get to in a second, in conducting notational and realizational strategies. Improvisation forces the child to engage a process of critical listening, real-time decision-making, and self-investigation in ways that music pedagogy in which an adult dictates that, that the child pr play the prescribed thing at the prescribed time simply does not. There's a feedback in improvisation. More, anyway. Free improvisation is valuable because it allows children to engage in this sonic quick sketching, outpouring of imagination and creati creativity that doesn't actually cost that much in the all-important resource of time. So to this end, many of our sessions have explored free and conducted improvisation techniques that come directly from the experimental music world. Walter Thompson's sound painting, Anthony Braxton's language music, um, if you, yeah, you can I'm going to skip a paragraph, but in this sort of beginner's version of sound painting that we call body play, we ask the ensemble to interpret the real-time actions of a conductor, a child conductor, with no symbolic repertoire of gestures at all, although in other cases we have introduced the symbolic 
gest gestures of sound gain. Um, with such a free and unconstrained relation between instruction and realization, one might assume that the music would sound amorphous. Yet, without any specific directions about how to interpret motion and sound from instructors, few ki kids fail to, for example, lock into and ultimately entrain to the one, two, the conductor's stomping feet, interpreting the, you know, ri rise in arms as a rise in volume or pitch. And the fact that how e of how easily and instinctually kids are able to uh, perform music from these broad physical cues should give pause to anybody who believes that kids must become competent in the basics of some tradition before being able to play as a unified ensemble. Um, in the case of body play, only the child conducting is really freely improvising. The rest of the group is perhaps better thought of as interpreting a real-time notation. Um, but it, so it's an exceptional, it's still, it's an exceptional case of allowing at least the conductor to do this kind of Scott sonic sketching, which they're the clear author and owner. Where body play is supremely ephemeral and allows for the immediate sounding of instincts and impulses, the graphic score represents another important pole of our search for new ways of allowing musical novices to realize their own creations in sound. We've taken two basic approaches to getting kids to notate music for realization by the ensemble, pictograms and line drawings. Uh, when the groups wanted to preserve and remember a certain sonic palette, we've asked them to develop pictograms. Then the conductors uh, use poster-sized scores or overhead projections to assemble scenes and sequences of these various sound worlds. And then we've also used a more conventional, you know, X is time, Y is pitch line drawing. Um, in both cases, our use of graphic notation is an attempt at strategic reification of a sound world or sound idea, one which presents kids with a focal point for memory and a vector for cementing the belief that the music they make could matter. In short, where a free improvisation may light up kids' imaginations best and fastest, notation becomes useful when we want to emphasize that kids' creations are worthy of being repeated, rehearsed, and cherished. Score-making activities also ask them to take a step back from sound and think in terms of structures and patterns giving them a distance from the activity in the moment so they can ask critical questions, how do this be different? So I'm going to conclude by suggesting that, distant as our practices are from anything that most people would recognize as music for novices, and close as these same practices may be to the activities of experimental musicians at work at crafting advanced notions of music's future in universities, the ULO's foregrounding of individualized creativity and understanding over collective reproduction resonates m m uh, very strongly, actually, with much more mainstream and possibly slightly sinister ideas around the knowledge economy that are exactly what Jason was talking about in his, um, uh, in his talk, as you'll see. As evidence, consider that improvisation has been formally recognized as a key musical competency by educators since 1994, when the first set of national standards for music educators were released, even though it still, 20 years later, remains drastically underutilized in school music pedagogy, frequently completely absent. Making sure the kids all learn to compose is also be, um, starting to receive a surprising amount of ink in these types of curricular standards, both on the state and national level. So my question is, why do the masters of the universe want to see more children creating their own, not merely reproducing others' music, even as few, very few band and choral directors agree or care? And I'd suggest that the answer concerns a monumental shift in the very idea of what human musicking in our society is for. Most children's music pedagogy emphasizes the brute production of sound right now, playing the right note at the right instant, to such a degree and to the exclusion of the attentive considerations of the fine gradations of time, tone, and tuning that make music sound in the parlance of our current music technologies human or humanized, <laughs> as the softwares tend to put it. In most domains of modern life, we have de-emphasized the teaching of skills that machines can do better than we do. The art of hand-scrubbing clothes has been allowed to lapse. And our synths and computers can easily beat any concert band in the world at playing in time and in tune. The human musician will care to listen to in the future, I'd argue, will excel at things that computers can't do, playing in a thoughtful, expressive, judicious, and spontaneous way. We at the experimental fringes of music might think we have a special link to these warmer, softer conceptions of music with no you know, conductor at the front. Um, but for the sake of a final provocation, I'd ask you to consider the notion that the post-industrial state eager to outsource brute labor and encourage the proliferation of creative classes who will drive the knowledge economy, might share a surprising number of our assumptions about what arts training is for. Where the industrial state asked us to work and play in lockstep formations and rigid hierarchies, the post-industrial state wants everyone to be a content producer, an engine of ideas, a nimble improviser. The ULO, just as um, do a lot of new graduate programs in music, provides an immediate sonic springboard for just this way of thinking and being. Thank you.
Yeah, I have a question for you about, um, you, you sort of um, remarked on the, the challenge of uh, convincing parents uh, of, of the validity of the kind of work you're doing, but could you just um, give some examples of actually how you do that? Well, in our case, it, it hasn't been a problem because we were asked to do this program by the director of this community center who, in an unincorporated area of, like, San Diego County that's just, like, you know, industrial sprawl. Um, he's like kind of the mayor, there's no mayor. So it, there was no convincing necessary on our part. He right. got the kids, they trust his judgment, They he asks them to come at a certain time, and there we are with, you know, hurdy-gurdies made from bicycle parts and, and stuff like that. So it, so we haven't encountered that challenge in this case. However, if I wanted to say some of the things I said in the last two paragraphs of my talk and hone that into a pitch, which I'm not sure I want to do because I'm happy to do it here, but outside of this context it feels icky, um, <laughs> I, then I might try something like that. And in grants, I sometimes do move slightly in that direction. Right. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm just uh, curious about the role that uh, ethnomusicology has in the interdisciplinary universe that you are working in. Because I saw it on, on the slides, yeah. and I don't know if I talk to program that was acknowledged. I'm just curries because well, I'm asking all those same questions. The, the answer will, will, will not will be a little bit disappointing because it's, it's more, in some ways, it's a placeholder right now. We, we were, we're hoping for a line in the future and we're hoping to really engage, and it's outside the area of my personal expertise. We've got a variety of people um, teaching it, but we are trying to deal with ethnomusicology in, a, in this sort of same manner, and, and as expansive, you know, and uh, expansive and, and um, also local and regional. And students go out and, and try to, you know, do research projects. They go out in the community and figure out what, what music actually is in our region. Um, and to their surprise, that, um, that there's, you know, different sort of ethnic music that bases uh, all from Colorado Springs and beyond and long, long histories. Um, college students has a long mining history, of course, and, and, uh, and there's, a, there's actually quite a lot of music still around from, from those periods, you know, and not to mention all the musicians that, that, that come in from other, all parts of the region of the world that find a home. You know, so that, that's one thing to engage in the research project, but it's more about the intention of the future and staking out that, that, that class and uh, trying to be interdisciplinary where we can with composition projects and multimedia and visual And is your vision for engaging with that, like seeing that from music college? I mean, this is just purely curious, but I don't know how to sure. perceive it from as something that is a, a discipline or as a, a model of a, like an interlinear or interdisciplinary. Uh, thing. You know what I mean? Like, because I'm not really sure what it is. Um, you know, is it a, is it a set of practices that's disciplinary that's, that you're mm -hmm. hoping to engage with, or is it, but it's, it's we haven't made those decisions really. I think we're really exploring, yeah. and um, what we really need is diversity in, in our in our department. You know, I mean, we have more, like more in, in, approach to yeah, in, in other perspectives. You know, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the search when we finally get this position because interdisciplinary will definitely be in there. I'm not sure how, I don't think we have any territory staked out for right. how we want to keep open to like the best ideas that come to us. Yeah. Well, with all three talks, it comes from a lot of uh, questions and sort of probing of my own assets. For example, we're going to touch on ethnomusicology. One of the things that was really true for me kind of throughout the talks, was really the fact that I think the job might be of redefining musical literacy, which you touched on. But what that might mean more extensively, touching on kind of world music or world beer, pop culture, maybe world music and so on, is getting to this notion of that, you know, 90% of the world deals with oral culture. And vernacular, I mean, we're translating that in terms of vernacular music, pop music culture, or like, Kind of, I'm going to use the 90s term, do it yourself, right? On your computer, your garage band, and make your geese. You never really have, you might, you may or may not have had a lesson in your life, but you're making all kinds of things. And I think that 
this is where we're situated in, in music, is how are we trying to make it palpable? They're working with young, young students who become the, the, the students that are going to apply to go to college. So what has been their previous musical experience, right? And then to touch on another thing, you talked about you know, using notation, right? And I, and I was thinking about, well, when we use notation, what does that set things up? Is, is only kind of a notative experience <coughs> a legitimate form of kind of validating musical practice and experimentation? Just a little bit, I was thinking about that. Um, and, you know, that prompted me to think about maybe Jair's work, about, well, where is the work? Is the work in the notation system itself, i.e., is music in how we've thought about music for 200 years and how we're transmitting this through, like, you know, classical music uh, paradigms and so on? Or are we asking that big question, where is the music today? That was touched on by DJ also. Where is the music? What is music now? And uh, what is our job to re rethink that really critically? And could be very uncomfortable for a lot of people, especially you know more of the senior uh, people that are holding court, you know, still from their early training. So this this is very generative. So thank you all three of you for these kinds of um, issues. It's really interesting. The electroacoustic ensemble uh, picked it up without putting it into well-defined terminology for students who try to. Uh, encourage creating their own languages and their own descriptions of how to communicate those languages, much in the way like a rock band, you know, a bunch of guys in a rock band who are 13 are trying to get across an idea to their buddies and fighting over like, oh, boom, bang, boom, you know, and, and, and shaping symbols in their heads, you know, and, and time frames in their heads and communicating those without using, you know, eighth notes and sixteenth notes. But then, of course, you can use that as well, so you try to create a meta language. But but that but it's it's very empowering for these students that can you know, to do that and that's okay and it's a it's a really and it's actually the, the, the pathway to creativity for them mm -hmm. and where notated music in, in many regards is not the pathway to creativity for them or for anybody who's even literate you know I mean it's, it's very much a free, I mean it's musically literate in the yeah. sense of, of going through musical languages when you're working in a group. You know, you don't say, I want five eighth notes and three eighth notes in this, blah, 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 blah. You play something, and it's an oral tradition that you're, you're tapping into that's ancient, you know, that is continuing. Yeah. I'll, I'll, just, yeah. I'll just add a little bit to this. I, in the, the, the sort of way that I was mapping out this long just, uh, debate about what sort of liberal arts are and general education requirements, all of that stuff in various ways transposes, I think, to the way that we devise um, requirements for undergraduate majors, and I would imagine for all the graduate level, too. And what I mean by that are the, the specific courses you're supposed to take, like what are the requirements you're supposed to fulfill to complete a degree. I tend to think of it, and what we've just gone through this process where we've reformulated what our music major is, so I thought a lot about this recently. <coughs> Think of it as a kind of combination of a kind of core breadth and specialization and depth within all of this. The core breadth and <coughs> specialization. And what I found is that, um, I mean, you sort of hinted at the kind of uh, dinosaur sort of phenomenon. I mean, when, we, when you sit at the table and you start to actually have these kind of conversations about what are the requirements for a degree going to be with your colleagues, you find that. That, uh, that the common territory often moves in this very dramatic way towards this notion of literacy. So with an undergraduate level, for instance, that means grappling with notation, it means sonata allegro form, it means all of these other things. And um, if you are a person that has more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary training, I'm not just talking about composition and ethnomusicology and musicology. I'm talking like ethnomusicology and cultural studies and post-colonial studies and critical theory and composition and stuff. You realize that that is a really new model in the grand scheme of things. So at the table, when you're trying to map out your common territory with, with your colleagues, um, it's very difficult to move past some of those, some of those ideas about um, canonization literacy, even if you find them problematic? I, well, I think a lot of that goes to the idea of assessment, though. 
when you have to show the NASM committee your deliverables of your student learning outcomes, these things have been codified and it's very easy to give them these things that deal with literacy. And it's much more difficult to say, well, this student discovered his ability to be creative. Exactly. You know, you can't show that to the committee in the same way you can say he wrote the sonata. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But I intended the, the last kind of couple of words of my paper to be a kind of ammunition for people who find themselves in the situation of having to fight against Sonata Allegro form and having to adopt the language of yeah no we having to adopt the, the, uh, the, the, the language of instrument you know an instrumentalized view of education like if you're trying to instrumentalize this more open sense of creativity I mean a lot of what you talked about it was kind of uh, like good stuff in that direction too but you know it's possible to do it you just have to decide that you're going to speak grant speak add, and, add one little thing to that though is that I think that um, there are ways to um, create assessment models for you know, cultural theory, for instance. Like, do you know who Stuart Hall is, or something like that? And, and some uh, student could say, yes, I've read something by Stuart Hall. But even that doesn't um, gain traction in these kinds of conversations about interdisciplinarity, building it into, into a program. Well, if it was, you know, we've tried to do assessment in the same way that everybody probably does now, you know, and there are ways to do it. You just simply have to say the means to an end. In some ways, you, you don't, you, you you play the game, right? And you have to be able to uh, assess a performance. You know, if there's a performance at the end of a product, like a theater production, perhaps, you know, or something, or, or a capstone, like a, a capstone is, is part of it is performance oriented or media oriented, and you include that media. And you include the value in the terminology that you use in your in, in your writing of that assessment, and it works perfectly well. You just have to take the time, and you have to have the means, and I think the go ahead to take those steps to actually use that assessment. It's and, certainly and easy those, to retract and back and to the kind of collective willpower. Yeah. Or just just one more question, and then maybe we can continue on the list. Uh, Jeff, just looking at the point of information, and maybe a newsflash about organization. Uh, first of all, with respect to NASA, uh, and everybody sh should understand that there is no campus in the University of California system that is a, that's a member of NASA, so that's not an issue for that. Um, we have to we have to uh, respond to WASC, our regional accreditor, which doesn't really care that much about the details of the music curriculum. Um, they do care about assessment, but um, two things. One is having uh, spent uh, the last three years in, in a number of uh, future strategic planning sessions with the other executive of NASA, I can tell you that at the top, there's a lot more interest in, and a lot more liberal thinking in these forward-looking institutions coming up with ways to address this than the membership <coughs> of NASA. Membership's way more conservative than the top of it. So just keep that in mind. If you've got an interesting idea, go for it you know, and, and put it forward. Uh, second is, and I'm reading here, um, this year's WASC conference, and, and I quote, this year the WASC conference will be focused on badges and credentials, MOOCs, and competency-based degree formats, etc. <laughs> you can read a lot into that. <laughs> <laughs> so please, um, let's thank our guests.